forward slash zero to indicate that there is an issue. Now, with this one here, so what I've done in all of the spreadsheets are marked in red where somebody needs to go back and just check the calculations. So the SSRS is wrong here. And sorry, which group is, uh, sorry, which group is that? Okay, let me see who's is that. This is our group, Emma. Oh, it's no. group. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So you can you can uh, state if it's yours. Yeah, because I wasn't going to bother putting people's names on this for the moment. So the issue there is that no score had been given for the cells. The absence of a cell gets a score. So that's why that one is like that. Um, see, then this is the second site. And the issue here, and I think a few people have this question about um, tax on richness. In BMWP and Q value, you only use the taxa that have uh, an indicator of value. But if you're reporting tax on richness for a site, it's every type that's present. So this one will be a uh, tax on richness of 10, I think. And I think you need to check that abundance because I think that's supposed to be 155. And then that yeah, has we're unsure happened. on whether the the last one there gets included or not. We we yes. actually have to ask you that. Yeah, that's right. And yes, it does because tax on richness is a separate metric, totally separate from Q value and BMWP. So okay. you do. Token ones. So that's why that just knocks out those, those calculations a little bit. But they're easy enough to fix. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so this one here is the same. Now, it's the same issue with the number of taxa, but I wasn't quite sure where you got the 101. I think so, that the, the total abundance, we also took out the uh, this one um, with an X next to it. So I think it should, should it be 105 instead? Yes. Yeah. It should be 105, yeah. Yeah, because there's one close to the top that has an X on it. We discluded that completely. Yeah. And that has four um, in it. It has four individuals, yeah. So it's not an indicator in the, in the biotic indices. Yeah. But it is uh, in this separate metric, which is richness and abundance. Yeah. So yeah. that will... Will fix, and I think this other one is probably the issue with the sellers again. Yeah, yeah. So that's not a big, big problem there. I'll just open one or two others, just to be sure. Let me see. Um, it was in as right on open. But overall, pretty good. Ah, oh, here's one that came in as a, as a PDF. Okay, let's see. I've got to share this if you can see it. I think this is it. Yeah, can you see that one? Did it come through to you? Yeah, we can see. Don't think there is much. Do you know what I, what I would say to you is don't bother putting in, um, say, the B's and the C's, etc., where there's no, if there's no um, tax at present, because that was confusing. Yeah, and that happened on not necessarily this one. Uh, I will see. Okay, here we go. Oh, yeah, do I, yeah, just you see this selection of B's and putting in these scores. That can be risky because you can make a mistake if you put in. There's no need to put in those. So it's only for the taxa that are present. So I think that one was fine there. Can you see that moving? Yeah. And this was the other one. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, that was the same problem there. The 155 and the 10. So you might go back then and just check that. Uh, yeah, read through these to divide by the 150. So let me check those then. 
and I think the last one was okay. Oh yeah, just remove the scores, yeah, the 19. And you had the 105 there, but there's a 101 and a 99 sitting there. What, where they came from. That that was kind of the same thing that Emma brought up where um ah. because some were excluded for Q class and yeah. So yeah. we know yeah. now. So that's fine. Yeah. And I think you need to check that uh, that BMWP score. Okay. And check the percentage EP figures. Yeah. Uh, that are based around that 105, so they're out a little bit. So a few little issues there. Um, let's try another one. So just show it. Yeah. Okay, we have this one up. Oh, yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So problem with this one that knocked it out a little bit was on the caseless and the cased caddis. So these are your caseless ones, and then you have down here are your cased caddis. So then the Bs and the Cs need to be checked. And so that knocked out these figures here. Okay, that was that one. Um, BMWP is, I think that should have been around 30. So you need to just go back and check that one. And that affects the ASPT. And the rest was okay on that. And then here again, it's the um, your caddis slides have knocked out your figures slightly. So just go back over and check check those. And this one here, the EPT richness, uh, you have 13 different types of EPT. So with 13 over 19 should be the answer there. And I'm not quite sure where you got. Uh, oh yeah, you're dividing by 17. P74. Yeah. So that's that's those. So I send that out. I think I'm just missing one more. I have the right one up now. I think this is the yeah. final fourth one. No, sorry, got to share. Right, the last of them now. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, so that one was okay. I think this was the only issue I had with this one. Just to go back and check the SSRS. Okay, not to switch into another one. Yeah. Okay, so we leave it at that. So overall, very good. I was impressed that the figures were very good, but there was little issues you had with just tax on richness. Now, you can see how time we are, because what we're going to do is we very briefly run through the impact of forest operations, and then I want to go through another metric with you called an AWIG. I just have to find the document that I'm looking for. So I'm just going to shut down a few of these spreadsheets. Okay. 
working on the laptop today, so I can't open so many documents. Okay, are you able to see that? Yeah. Right. Okay. So we're looking at potential impact of forestry operations. And so we're mainly talking about um, commercial forestry on stream water quality. Okay, so just some figures then. So we have um, as current country just under 11 percent and most of that is coniferous or uh, trees that are grown for timber production. They take about up to 30 years to reach maturity and most of them are planted on upland peaty soils and concentrated in the catchments of first to second order streams where you have low dilution capacity. Now, the Water Framework Directive characterization exercise that was carried out during the first management cycle identified forestry operations as a potential source of diffuse pollution. And that has also been picked up in recent reports as well. So the types of diffuse pollution that we're talking about are acidification, eutrophication, and siltation. So we're going to touch on those briefly. So acidification then, results from these chemical changes. So acidification, which is an increase in hydrogen ion concentration, and in combination with that, you have mobilization of heavy metals. So you have heavy metals brought into solution. The most common heavy metal in soils is aluminum. So if you have acidic water flowing through soils, it brings that aluminum into solution. And the other thing that can occur is a reduction in base cation, so we're talking about calcium and magnesium principally. <clears throat> now, acidification has implications for the We know that they all live within the particular preferred pH range. So low pH can eliminate your salmonids in particular and reduce the diversity of invertebrates. So you're going to have some invertebrates that are sensitive to low pH and others that are tolerant. And then we're going to use that information to calculate another index, which you will apply to your set of data. Now, so how does a forest cause or exacerbate acidification? And there's a number of mechanisms that are involved. The first and probably the one that has been best described is interception of atmospheric pollutants. So we're talking mainly about sulfate and nitrogen compounds. And then, so they're intercepted or scrubbed by the canopy. They get um, then increased in concentration on the, can on the canopy due, due to evaporation. And then there is, a, and, and then those pollutants, sulfates, get washed down into river courses. And what happens if you use something like sulfate that's captured on the canopy and goes down into the soil, it is negative, so it's a negative ion, and it brings with it hydrogen ion. So it leaves as weak sulfuric acid, and it's the hydrogen ion that causes the change in pH. Now, the next mechanism is called interception of sea salt. So you might wonder, what is the relationship between sea salt and acidification. And it's again the process of that occur in soils. So the forest canopy can intercept sea salts, so sodium and chloride, sea salt. Again, it's washed down into the soil, but what happens in the soil is that sodium can be retained. So the soil particles hold on to sodium and they exchange the sodium for hydrogen. 
So what's leaving with the chloride is hydrogen, HCl. And that's what causes your change in your pH. And that's known as the sea salt effect. Another mechanism, but it's probably not that strong in terms of acidification, is what we call base cation exchange for hydrogen ion. And this is where the trees themselves take up calcium and magnesium, but they can't take positive ions without exchanging them for something like this to maintain ion balance. So they exchange them for hydrogen ion. So the soils and the associated waters become more acidic. Two other mechanisms. This one here, reduced contact with soils for buffering reactions. This occurs where you have extensive drainage of a forested catchment and the water is therefore channeled off that catchment very quickly. It means that the water doesn't have time or sufficient contact with soil and bedrock to enable buffering and acidity that's present. And the final one then is just oxidation of organic matter, sulfate to release um, just organic materials. So the DOC or dissolved organic carbon is very much a driver of acidification. So a whole suite of, of um, I suppose, mechanisms that are operating either individually or in combination. Other thing to point out is that the mechanism involved in forest media acidification varies through the life of the forest. And also varies with type of deposition and the potential for that deposition to have pollutant, pollutant materials. So if you take um, <clears throat> interception of pollutants, that occurs most effectively when the canopy closes. So at 15 years plus. Finally, but equally important is that the sensitivity of different freshwater resources to acidification varies. So it depends on the natural pH range of the receptor, the alkalinity or buffering capacity, and that's influenced by the geology. So for those of you that are doing the other module, you know now that if you have an alkalinity value less than 10 milligrams per liter calcium carbonate, that's an acid sensitive water. Also depends on whether there are Acidifying pollutants present, so the deposition of pollutants, the proximity to the sea would influence the potential for that sea salt effect. And finally, but equally important, it depends on the amount of forest cover in the catchment. So in a small patch, you're not going to notice anything, but a forest cover certainly covers at least 25% of the catchment. You, you can have uh, forest mediated acidification. So we therefore can define these as a series based on the geology. So in the Wicklow, Panamara, Donegal, you have granite mica schist. So those would be the most sensitive to acidification. Slightly less sensitive is the old red sandstone areas in the Old Carolina. And at the moment, most of the forestry is concentrated in these regions, or at least most of the mature forestry. So you can see the Wicklow Mountain here, one of the most heavily forested counties in the country. You can see the band of granite down here, and that's surrounded by many mica schist. So all the waters draining those there are low conductivity waters that are episodically acidic. And we've been doing studies over a number of years on forestry operations and water quality. So this is one of the older studies here, Aquifor, Four Watt, and indeed more recently Hydrofor, that has looked uh, principally at the Wicklow area there. So you can see that you have the Vartry Reservoir and all the streams flowing into it. You have the Avenue, Avon Bay catchment. And then you have the headwaters of the Wicklow, and a lot of those are deforested. So, what have we learned from these studies? So, 
give us an opportunity to look at the character of these upland streams. So at low water flow, they're generally ankle deep. Um, they are fast flowing, dominated by these coarse substrates for most of their course between the headwaters and, and the sea. Low flow, this is what the stream looks like. And then when you have rainfall, water level rises quite rapidly up to a meter in a very short period of time. And that coincides with the drop in pH. So they are episodically acidic. And that's what it looks like in terms of hydrogen ion concentration. So you need to remember that as pH drops, hydrogen ion concentration increases. For every one unit drop in pH, you have a tenfold increase in pH. Oh, sorry, in hydrogen ion concentration. And the same then in reverse. For every one unit increase in pH, you have a tenfold drop in hydrogen ion concentration. So this peak here corresponds to a pH of about 3.8. 100 microequivalents is your pH of 4. Okay, and this is the character of those streams in the winter area and in the contracted and then you have the mountainous areas around the country. So you get these little small increases in hydrogen ion concentration corresponding to a decrease in pH. So it rises and it falls. Whether you have had forestry to that, which have severe increases in um, hydrogen ion concentration, and that increase in hydrogen ion concentration or decrease in pH tends to be a little bit more abrupt and it tends to be more prolonged. Now, I mentioned that you can have mobilization of heavy metals. So the most common one is aluminium. And so normally we measure two, we take two aluminium measurements. First is total aluminium, and the second is just the inorganic fraction. So that's just aluminium three plus, for example. And because that is inorganic, it's not bound to organic material, it can potentially bind to biological tissues. So it is toxic to fish and other aquatic biota above a certain threshold. So just have a look at some of the data in those screens. So this is a moorland stream, and three sites from the headwaters moving downstream. And here you can see the total aluminium, and then what we call the, la um, the, the labile or the inorganic fraction. That's shown in the dark line. The red is the threshold that we shouldn't exceed to protect fish and other aquatic biota. And you can see from the stream here that you seldom exceed that threshold. Compare that to this one here. Where you have forest cover ranging from 11 down to 40% of the catchment cover. And if you look at this site alone, you can see on most of the dates that were sampled, the inorganic aluminium exceeded that threshold. This was a river site where there were no salmonids living and no mayflies and overall reduced diversity of microinvertebrates, a community that was dominated by stoneflies. Uh, the sources of acidity that we identified was interception of these uh, acid um, pollutants and also high inorganic or high organic carbon, in other words, organic acids. But there was another mechanism operating, and that related to the reduced buffering capacity because of rapid runoff. So here we have the two streams, the Amaleka, that was the one that had the higher peaks in acidity and the high aluminium concentration, so it's a forested catchment, and then the Balamagee was the control. What you can see in this graph is that at low water level, the discharge 
or the flow from those catchments from the sites are quite similar. So measured in terms of cubic meters per second per unit catchment. But during the flood, the rainfall, you have much higher discharge from the forested catchment. The reason being explained. And that also reduces the potential buffering capacity in the system. So it makes it, makes it more acidic. Now, in recent years, there's been a change in the dominant drivers of this of, um, forest mediated acidification. So in the 1990s, when we when studied this mainly a uh, deposition of these uh, atmospheric acid pollutants, but today organic acids are the dominant driver. In fact, there's been about a 35% increase in dissolved organic carbon in the water since the 1980s. And this is, well, the reason for it is not entirely clear. It might partly be related to climate change and that sort of drying and warming and, and higher decomposition of the peat. Or it may be partly related to the reduced um, sulfate inputs, which would uh, tend to produce acidic conditions that would uh, prevent decomposition. So it's probably a combination of both of those factors. In terms of impact on aquatic biota, the salmonids are particularly susceptible and they're certainly absent where you have prolonged acidity or where you have high levels of inorganic ammonia. Combination with that, Sites that have high and prolonged acidity generally have impoverished vertebrate fauna and, in particular, an absence of mayflies in the most acidic sites. So that's the real indicator. Eggs and juveniles of the salmonids tend to be most susceptible to acidification, particularly the egg stage. The egg membranes can become extremely fragile. So we've done some experiments, and just to show you that methodology where we place salmonid eggs in these containers in the food bank boxes um, with some gravel. So they have an opening on the side, and I'm going to have that on the next page. Oops. And they have an opening on the side that allows um, water to move freely through it, so the eggs can be oxygenated. We have a cap on the, on the surface there, so it means you can pick them up empty out the eggs, have a look at what is hatched or hasn't hatched, and then we bury them in the bottom of the river in batches. So they correspond to artificial reds. Okay. Some in some of these experiments we planted with what are called eyed and green ova. So the green ova or eggs are eggs that are just um, recently fertilized, freshly fertilized, and the eyed ova is where you can see the eye of the, the larva developing. Just quickly, some results. So here on the left are the two rivers that I just mentioned, the one with the honey forest cover. Absolutely no eggs survived. The one on the left had 4% forest cover and relatively low survival, but that would be typical of those types of streams. Now, over on the right here, we have two streams, one with 21, another with 44% cover, and you can see much higher survival. The reason for the higher survival is the presence of higher concentrations of calcium that protect the fish from some of the effects of hydrogen higher. In this river, almost half of the eggs survived, but when the larvae hatched, they died very quickly from the effects of inorganic aluminium in that particular stream. So even though the hatching success was high, they later died because of aluminum. The ephemeroptera then are particularly good indicators of uh, acidification impacts. And some of the other studies that we've done has indicated that, you know, in control sites that have low levels of acidity, you have relatively high numbers of a range of species. So in these particular sites here, there were five to nine different um, species. For example, 40% of the sites had five species. 
Whereas where you have um, more than 50% cover of the catchment in these um, granite areas with peaty soils, quite a high percentage of the sites will have no mayflies, or at best, they will have one or two mayfly species present. So you can see the, the contrast between the two groups of sites. So I would say to you, as always, look out for the, the mayflies. I'm just going to hop on to something else. Sorry, Mary. Too Sorry. Yeah. Um, would the mayflies be able to survive um, episodic acidification? Or, or yes, I... a certain level of it, yeah. They're adapted to living in environments where pH changes. But what I reckon is that they can't tolerate the, the rapid changes in pH or the prolonged changes, and that's more typical of some of these streams which are impacted by forest-mediated acidification. Okay, thanks. Okay. So that's just what happens really at the mature stage. You have that potential for forest mediated acidification. If the trees are planted on the geology with poor buffering capacity, your granite or magnetic schist, if the soils are peaty, if the catchments are steep, and if you have a high percentage of the catchment covered, so something in excess of 25%. 25% is the figure that I reckon might be a threshold for catchment cover. So that's one of the issues. The other issue then is what happens when you harvest the trees and you planted these trees on peat and the peat is very soft, so it's easily eroded. And not only that, but you're leaving materials on site that they call brash. And that brash decomposes and can release nutrients. And so those are the two big problems. You can see the typical site that has been harvested. It's, you know, quite broken up and if you have rainfall all that soil can be carried into into the rivers and then you have machinery crossing the river so it, it leads to bank erosion and so on so we in part of these studies we collected samples during what we call the the, the peak the flood event we collected the samples at different points during the flood event. So we're able to look at what, what is happening at what we call the rising limb and what's happening during the receding limb. And most of the pollutants that come in from the surface come in on the ascending limb or the rising limb. So just show you two graphs. One relates to suspended solids. So you have the flow in blue and you have the sus suspended solids in red. And this is sort of pre-felling right through the felling. And so as felling progressed, needless to say, there was more soil disturbance. And towards the end of the felling, you get the highest level of suspended solids coming into the river. The threshold for suspended solids is 25 milligrams per liter. And look at what we're dealing with here. Thousands of milligrams per liter. So that's an issue. And the other thing is that you have potential for phosphorus. Now, the phosphorus can come in with the soils, or the, which is mainly peat, or the phosphorus can come in or be uh, increased from decomposition of the brush. That which is coming in during the felling is largely coming in with the soil. So you're getting a pattern that is similar to that which we saw from the suspended soils. Okay. Another operation which is called wind growing, and this is after the trees have been harvested, all of the brush is brought into lines to allow space to replant. And that's what it looks like. You see all these lines in the background? That's what's called wind growing. I don't know why it's called wind growing. But that too can release both suspended solids and phosphorus. And it increases as you windrow more of the site. And a lot of that is related just to soil disturbance, as well as the decomposition of those lines of, of brush. Okay, so that is it in summary.
what I want to show you mainly is the how to calculate an A wig. We have about 10 minutes to do that and leave you with um, an exercise. Okay, so, so acidification can have an impact on uh, communities and principally by eliminating those which are acid sensitive. So again, how do we capture that? Can you see that? How do we capture that in um, a metric? And how do we convert that into an ecological quality ratio? So I'm going to show you this metric known as AWIC. So it's the Acid Water Indicator Community Index. And again, this presentation is on Brightspace. So just try and follow what I want to go through now. In its original form, it was very similar to um, BMWP. In that, the invertebrates, can I just can you set this as a slideshow? Okay, sorry. Now, can you see that as a slideshow? So, invertebrates grouped according to their, in this case, sensitivity to um, pH or, or hydrogen ion. So, you have highly sensitive through to the most tolerant. And if you look at the group of tolerant taxa, these are mainly stone flies. All right. Now, oh yeah. In the original form, what we had to do was assign each taxon a score, add up the scores, and divide by the number of scoring taxa similar to the BMWP. But to make it more relevant to Water Framework Directive, they introduced um, a scoring related to the abundance. So we'll just go on to this here. So the first step is to assign your taxa to the sensitivity group, highly sensitive through to tolerant. Then look at the abundance. So if you have a highly tolerant species, and there's, no, there's less than, there's only eight of them, you give it a score of three. If you have a hundred of them, then you give it a score of one. That's okay so far. Remember again, only seven a score. So here is this one. Highly sensitive agapetus, uh, we give it a score of 12 because there is just one of them present. So if I went back and looked for agapetus, sorry, agapetus is up here, so it's highly sensitive. So this is my sheet, I have one of them, it's highly sensitive, so I give it a score of 12. Okay, you get that? So, Amphinumura, it's tolerant. I have six of it, and I give it a score of five. That's where I got it there. Anybody have any questions? Or are you following it? Okay. And there's other examples there where I just put in, put in the scores. So that's that bit. So, so you're going to add all of those scores and you will get a, an average score. And then you have to relate it to a threshold. And there's different thresholds set depending on whether you're dealing with clear or humic water. So it's either seven 
7.63 or 7.38. So we'll show that on another slide. And then you get a, you get a value between 0 and 1. And you have to decide whether you're dealing with what boundary you're dealing with. Is it high to good status? So that'll be something from um, 0.93 if you're dealing with humic waters or 1 if you're dealing with clear waters. Okay, so that's the type of water that you're dealing with. So you have a threshold or a reference value. And then that reference value has to be divided. Uh, your, your, your observed value has to be divided by your reference value. And then you have to interpret that. What does that, what does actually, what does that mean in terms of your um, in terms of your uh, score for the site? So what I've done here, and I um, would like you to attempt this exercise. The only way of whether I know you, I know if you know it. So I've left some of these blank here. So you have to fill in that AWIC score there. You have to sum them all. So I've only given you three to find. Sum them all will give you your WFD AWIC score. You divide it by the number of scoring taxa. You get a score for that. Um, because we're dealing with the site that is, is humic, high scoring DOC, your reference value is 7.38. So you take your score and you divide it by 7.38. You'll get a value somewhere between zero and one, or maybe slightly over the one, and then you assign status to that. That is your exercise for the next day. Now, is there any aspect of that that you don't follow? I'll summarize it. First thing you do is determine whether that is tolerant or highly sensitive or what. Then go to this table here. And get a score that you're going to put in on that sheet. How do you know if it's sensitive or tolerant? You use this here. And because it's developed for the Water Framework Directive, you don't have to worry about these scores here. You're only using this to determine whether it is highly sensitive or tolerant to work on this table here for the actual scoring. I know that sounds a bit hard. To follow until you actually do it. So if you follow what I've done there, and hopefully you have done it all, and then you apply that, that to this exercise here. So you only have three to fill. Anybody have any questions on that? How do you determine the reference EQR score? That is set. Okay. Um, so it's de determined by the DOC level. So see the 7.38 um, here, humic water. So that is th those are set. Um, so here we would probably be using that level for most of our rivers there. See the values here. So clear water is where the DOC value is less than 10. If it's more than 10, it's a humic water. And, um, Scotland have a slightly different value for their clear waters as they go to the rest of England and Wales. So those are the values that are set. In the exercise that I've given you, I've listed because it's 11 milligrams, it's a humic water, and therefore your reference value is 7.38. So you have to fill these three scores add up all the scores as you did for BMWP, divide by the number of scoring taxa. Remember, it next means it's absent, so it's not a scoring taxon. Then you get a score, you divide it by the reference value, and you get your EQR. Right, so what you're going to do is you're going to update your or correct the errors in the microinvertebrate sheet that you submitted to me. I have to return them to you. 
and then you add, I'll add in a line where you're going to put in those values, or you will calculate the values for, um, for your sites. But do this one as a practice run. Check that everybody is getting the same answer. Then maybe in, in your group, if you send me back this sheet here, I'll check it before you do the calculations on the, the, the three sites that we're working with. That's it. Anybody else got a question on it? So this is the practice run. I'll create a folder for you to put that one in, one from each of your groups. I'll return the macroinvertebrate Excel spreadsheets and you do an ERIC calculation for your sites. And that is the bulk of the metrics you'll be allowed to know that I'm going to deal with in this, in this module. So are, we, so are we submitting this one that you have on screen now? Or is this just a practice yes. one? Yeah, this is a practice one. I just want to make sure you get that bit right before you waste your time on the other. So I'll create an A-week practice folder, and then I'll create another macroinvertebrate folder, finalized. So we get all of those correct. So it means you just any any of those that I had marked in red that I have to go back and recalculate. That means that everybody has a full sheet, full set of data with the right correct metrics on it. That's okay. So I think we meet for this module again on Wednesday. So I'll try and get this done this evening, get these up for you. And then if you can do the practice run tomorrow. Um, I mean, I think on Wednesday I'm going to be dealing with sediment. So if you want to, towards the end of the week, finalize the other sheets so that you have, have enough time to do it. So there's no rush, immediate rush with the with the, the main uh, sheet with the three sites on it. But I just want to get this bit right first of all. So this one, this sheet, practice run, could be done before Wednesday, so that I have time to look at it and give you feedback on it. All right. And might be useful again for your group, individuals in the group. Do the exercise and then see if you can all get the same answers, and then one person gets submitted. Anybody else have a question? Um, you had our group's um, last submission as a PDF. I, I don't know how that happened, but I'll send you the Excel in case that's easier for giving us the feedback. Uh, no, it should be all right because I've just marked, but if you want to send it to me, then I'll just mark everything in red because I wasn't putting arrows from. from yeah, and the, the, the formatting got all weird. I'll send you the Excel now. Yeah, yeah, that's Thanks. good. And then I'll mark them up and send it to you. Anybody else have any other requests? Yeah, make sure that everybody in your group does the calculations because that's important for the individuals as well as, as the group effort. Okay, and when you're going through those calculations, particularly, you know, your Q value, BMW, P, ASPT, think about what are the major differences between those index systems? You know, suppose I give you that in an exam, for example, would you be able to tell me what would be the major differences between them? And that really gets you to think about how they're, they're calculated and understand their, their limitations. All right, but apart from that, um, you did a good 